Uh, sir, we will take another couple of minutes, sir. Yeah, sure, that would be fine. fine. Yeah, whenever you're ready, let me know. Sure, 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 sure. sure, sure. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, so can we start yeah. now? Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, so thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, very warm welcome to 14th Samba talk. Today we have a distinguished INA fellow, Professor Jain Haritsa. Professor Jain Haritsa is a senior professor at the Department of Computational and Data Sciences and Department of Computer Science and Automation at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Professor Jayant Haritsa received his B.Tech degree from IIT Madras, followed by an M.S. and a Ph.D. degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
He was a research fellow in, in Institute for System Research, University of Maryland, before joining as a faculty in Computer Science Department at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, in 1993. Professor Jayant Harsisa's uh, work lies at the intersection of database systems and data mining, with a focus on query processing across a range of database systems. Professor Jayant Harsisa is bestowed with many accolades. He is an ACM Distinguished Scientist, a winner of the prestigious Shanti Soru Bhatnagar, Bhatnagar Prize. He is a winner of the prestigious Infosys Prize in the year 2014. He is also the recipient of the Swana Jayanti Fellowship of the DST, Sir C. V. Raman Eng Scientist Award in Computer Science, and Research Awards from IBM, Google, and Microsoft. Professor Jayant Haritha is a fellow of many prestigious associations and societies like IEEE, Indian National Academy of Sciences, Fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering, Fellow of National Academy of Sciences, and Fellow of Association for Computing Machinery. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jayant Haritha to Sambad. Sir, it's our pleasure to have you on Sambad and thanks for accepting our invitation. Before I hand over, I have a small request to audience to post their questions in the Q&A box on the lower side, uh, lower right side of the screen. The same will be addressed by Professor Jayant at the end of the talk. Sir, over to you and thank you very much, sir. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, let me just get my slides up. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes, sir. So it's in the full screen uh, mode, sir. Yes. Uh, is this visible now? Sure. Sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so shall I uh, uh, start? Sure, sir. Sure. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so firstly, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, good afternoon to all of you in the virtual audience. Uh, I'm especially pleased to present this talk in the Sambad series, which has been organized by IIT Dharwad and the Bangalore chapter of INAE. So uh, popular perception in the public at large and certainly in the popular press is that scientific breakthroughs are predicated on having dazzling ideas whose brilliance is immediately self-evident on their description. For example, something like quantum mechanics. But if you are concerned, like me, about your ability to have such spectacular ideas, then my message is, please don't lose hope. Because as I will try to show in today's talk, there is scope to obtain potent outcomes, even with stupid ideas. The key here is that it is not enough to have just one stupid idea, because then, of course, you will not get very far. But if you have at least two stupid ideas, and perhaps more if you are good at it, and then get these to work together in tandem, you may come up with surprisingly effective solutions. And I'll try to prove this claim through the specific notion of robust database query processing, which we have worked on in our lab at IISC during the past decade. So before I get into the actual technical presentation, I thought it would be good to give you a real world analogy about the proposition that I am trying to evangelize here. And the example I have chosen is from the Commonwealth Games that were held in Delhi in 2010. And at the time, as you may recall, there was a lot of talk about the money that had been spent on the games. On one side, the official valuation was around 5,000 crores. And I'm sure that none of you believed it, saying it is unrealistically low, given the massive infrastructure that is part of such mega projects. That is, it is a ridiculous underestimate. On the other hand, if you considered what was being said in the press, by our hyperventilating media, the spec speculation was that the expense had reached 70,000 crores. And also, you would have thought that this is ridiculously high and unrealistic, especially in 2010, and that this is an improbable overestimate. So if you look at these two numbers, they both look completely divorced from reality. And you may be tempted to toss them away as meaningless numbers. But I will claim that you can take these two illogical valuations and produce a surprisingly accurate result. Specifically, 
if you happen to take the geometric mean of these two numbers, that is of 5,000 and 70,000, then the number you will come up with is around 18,700 crores. And now, believe it or not, if you go and look at the CAG audit report that was subsequently tabled in parliament, you will find that the number is surprisingly close, around 18,500 crores. So the point I'm trying to make is that even though you started off with extremely silly values, you could still derive something very meaningful by combining them in the right way. In fact, you will also notice this in haggling at the street markets. The seller will quote some absurdly high price X, and then you will say a very small amount Y, and then he will reduce X by some amount, and you will increase Y by some amount, and so on and on, until you converge on a common price. Next time, just take the geometric mean of X and Y, that is the vendor's price and your uh, 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 starting value, and you will find that it's likely that you will come up with the correct price. Of course, you will lose the joy of haggling in the process. So I'll now move on to the technical part of this presentation. And since we may have a heterogeneous audience from different engineering branches, I will start with a quick overview of database systems. So database management systems or DBMS, as they are more affectionately known, are extremely large and complex software systems that run into millions of lines of code. They are intended for efficiently and conveniently handling enterprise data, that is data from large institutions or companies, through its entire life cycle, starting from capturing the data, then subsequently storing it, asking questions of this data, and maintaining it for the long term. Not surprisingly, you will find that the database systems are the cornerstone of our software industry today, and that the majority of the computational infrastructure, the majority of the software engineers, and the majority of the financial investments are all tied up with database systems. Popular commercial database packages include DB2 from IBM, SQL Server from Microsoft, and Exadata from Oracle. While in the public domain, Postgres and MySQL have large user communities. The reason that these database packages have become extremely popular is that they provide a large number of goodies. And in particular, I will highlight two of these benefits here. So the first benefit is that database systems offer you peace of mind. And what I mean by that is that any changes you make to a database repository are guaranteed to be immune to any kinds of subsequent failures whether it's a power failure, a hardware failure, a network failure, or anything else that might go wrong. That is, unlike operating systems, which only provide best effort, database systems offer cast iron guarantees. So in a sense, you can think of them as the Sri Sri Ravi Shankar of the information world, minus the long hair, of course, because database systems are more, which implement what is called as imperative or procedural programming. In that model, you have to specify every step of the way to reach the target goal. So, for example, if you want to invert a matrix, you would have to specify that the matrix should be loaded into a main memory array. Then you have to explicitly compute the minors, the cofactors, the adjoints, the determinants, and so on. However, in database systems, you can just say, hey, look, this is the information I want, and then leave it to the system to figure out how to compute it. So in a sense, it is similar to what professors do when poor PhD students come and ask them, what should I do? All that we say is, 
go write a great thesis. Don't ask me how. Of course, I'm sure that IIT Dharwad is an exception. They have the faculty are much nicer. They actually write the thesis for you. Okay. Over the past five decades, since the inception of database systems, a special flavor called Relational Database Systems, or RDBMS for short, has become the industry workhorse. And the example database packages that I mentioned previously all fall into this class. RDBMS are based on the mathematical notion of first order logic, and they were designed by Edgar Cord from IBM Research. And for this seminal work, he received the Turing Award, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Computer Science way back in 1981. So in the database community, we have a saying that we believe in God and not God. The basic idea in the relational model was that unlike the prior data models of the 1950s and 60s, where all the connections between various information entities was hardwired through explicit pointers, in the relational model, all connections are done through values. And specifically, the data is stored in a set of relations, which for the purpose of this talk, you can think of as tables with rows and columns. The tables, the, the columns are the attributes, the rows are the entities. And then there are relationships and constraints on these columns. So to make this concrete, here is a simple university database with three tables. A student table with the roll number, name, and address. Then there is a course table, which tells you the course number, its title, and the number of associated credits. And finally, there is a register table, which tells you which student has registered for which course in the semester and the grade obtained in the course. You will see that some of the column names like roll number in student have an underline under them. And this is a visual representation of a constraint that the roll numbers of all the students must be unique. Schematic, you can now insert rows that give you specific data instances as you see in the slide. So for example, you will find that Jayant in Bangalore has a roll number of 81061. And in fact, this was my roll number during my undergrad at IIT Madras. And you can also figure out how old I am from this information. And then you see that I have registered for the DBMS course with number E0261, which is actually the course number in IISC. And then since I made up the slide, I was very kind to myself and gave an A plus grade. Now, the way that you interface with a database system after you have put in the data is typically through a language called SQL or structured query language. Sometimes it's also called a SQL. And this was again created by IBM Research in the 70s. To show an example of this language in operation, suppose that the dean of IIT Dharwad wanted to output a report that listed the names of the students and the courses that they are taking in this semester. Then all you would have to do is to write the SQL query that is shown in the yellow box, where the green words are SQL keywords, and the rest tells you what information you would like to obtain. So the first line is saying that you would like to pull out the names of the students and their associated course titles. And the source of this information is present in the student course and register tables. That's the from statement in the second line. And then in order to make sense of this combination, you have to enforce the conjunctive predicates that the roll number should match across the student and register tables. And similarly, the course number should match across the register and course tables. So recall that I mentioned earlier that SQL is unlike other programming languages. 
that it is a declarative language specifying only ends and not means. And you might be wondering as to what was left unspecified in this SQL query. And I will now explain this aspect. So if we consider this combination of information across the various tables, this is referred to as a join in the database terminology and represented, and I hope you can see the cursor here, this red circle here, and is represented by a bow tie symbol. And this join operator is a binary operator that takes two tables as input and produces another table as output. In this particular query, we have two joins, one between student and register and the other between register and course. So one option that you have is to first join S, that's the student table with R, the register table, and then join it, the resultant that is here with the C, the course table. Alternatively, for vastu reasons, you may want to first join the register table with course and then join it with the student table. The result of both sequences of operations would be exactly the same because join is both a commutative and associative operator. So you can easily prove that the sequence does not affect the logical output. However, the amount of time taken to produce the output could be drastically different between the two sequences. The first may finish within a few seconds, whereas the latter may take a few years to complete. So what has been left unspecified in the query is the specific join order across the tables in that are participating in the query. Secondly, even if you did decide a particular sequence, that does not complete the execution picture. This is because the join operator is logical. It's saying combine these two tables with these kinds of predicates. But there are a variety of physical implementations available for join. So this is very similar to like the sorting operator. You may have a bubble sort or you may have quick sort or you may have selection sort and so on. Similarly for join, over the decades, there have been a variety of algorithms that have been designed, including nested loops join, sort merge join, hash join, index join, semi join and so on. So we still have to decide this mapping between the logical join operator and the specific choice of physical implementation. This process of identifying the appropriate join sequences and join implementations is automatically done by a module within the database engine, which is called as the query optimizer. And the strategy it suggests is referred to as a query execution plan or plan for short. So here is how a typical plan looks like. And the, uh, uh, this plan corresponds to the university example that I showed you earlier, where we are trying to output the student course combinations. So the plan is a tree of operators that are evaluated in a bottom-up fashion. And as you go up through the tree, various kinds of computations are being done on the data and at the very top, you finally get the student course output. To make this more con concrete, consider for example, this operator. What it is saying is that use an index scan to access the information in the course table. So database systems usually have a variety of indices like B plus trees, bitmap indices, hash indices, and so on. So it could be one of these indexes. And then in the next step, join this information with the register table using a sort merge join with the register table, which is being accessed using a table scan followed by a sort operator. And to get the final result. So you can see that the original logical objective has been converted into a physical plan. In this particular case, 
the preferred sequence of joins is to first join C with R, that is course with register, and then join it with the student. And you also know that the join implementation, so the first join is a sort merge join, and this one is a hash join. You will also see that each of these operators has two annotations in green and red colors. The green annotation, like what you see here, is called as card, or which is short for cardinality. And it captures the amount of data that is going from this operator to the next one downstream. And this is typically measured in terms of the number of rows. So here, for example, we are saying that there'll be 1,000 student rows that will be sent from this operator to the subsequent hash join, which is the next operator downstream in this particular flow of data. On the other hand, the red annotation, which is called as cost, tells you the amount of effort involved in processing the data that has come to this operator. And this is usually measured in time units. So in this operator, the cost involved in doing the scanning process on the student table is computed as being expected to be around 6,800. And as you go up through the tree, the cost shown at each operator is the accumulated or aggregate cost of the entire subtree below it. So when you come to this level of the tree, where there's a hash join, the cost that you see here is the cost of executing this entire subtree. That is why all the numbers keep increasing as you go up the tree. And the cost now we are saying is close to 286,000, which is the cost of doing this entire set of operations, including the various index and table scans, as well as the joints. Now, it's perfectly okay if you did not follow all the details here, that actually doesn't matter. The message I'm trying to get across is that there is this magical module called the Database Query Optimizer, which has automatically come up with this particular plan, which it thinks will give you the fastest response time. So in order to figure out this optimal plan, each database engine has its own secret sauce, but at their core, they all follow the same paradigm, which is shown in this picture. And notice that finding the optimal plan is not an easy problem because there are an exponential number of plan candidates from which we need to pick the best. So even if you just had, for example, n tables in your query, then there are n factorial sequences of the join order. So the way that it works is that at the input, you give your declarative SQL query queue, and then this query optimizer goes through a complex dynamic programming exercise to sift through the large space of plan alternatives. And finally, it comes out with the optimal plan P, which has the least cost. And again, for the purpose of this talk, that the least cost plan essentially means the fastest strategy to produce the query results. So this dynamic programming module here is fed with two models, which compute the green and red numbers that I showed you in the previous slide for each of the operators. The red numbers come out from an estimation model that is primarily a function of the hardware capability and the quality of the software engine. Whereas the green numbers come out of an estimation model that depends on the distribution of data within a column, as well as correlations of distributions between columns in the same table or across tables. So, so far everything looks hunky-dory in theory. However, in practice, what we find is that this supposedly optimal plan choice that is being presented by the database query optimizer may at runtime actually turn out to be highly suboptimal. And when I say highly suboptimal, I don't mean that it is worse by 20, 30, 40%. What I mean is that it could be orders of magnitude worse than the optimal. So for example, a thousand times worse. And in fact, we have even found instances where the plan chosen by the database optimizer is a million times slower than the genuine ideal solution. 
So you might be wondering, how do you make such spectacular mistakes? Well, the blame can be attributed to errors in the underlying cost and cardinality models. The cost model typically has errors of around 30 to 40 percent. So its impact is limited. But when it comes to the cardinality model, which predicts the amount of data that is flowing from one operator to the next in this uh, uh, plant tree, all bets are off. You can have huge mistakes. There are a variety of technical reasons as to why these models are so erroneous. And some of these are listed here at the bottom of the slide. But in the interest of time, I won't go into them. Suffice it to say that the real world is quite ugly. And in case you don't trust me, here is a proof by authority. The photo that you see in the slide is that of Dr. Guy Lohman, who was the father of the IBM DB2's query processing engine and a highly respected member of the industrial research community. As recently as 2014, Guy Lohman wrote a blog post on the ACM site, which he rhetorically titled, Is Query Optimization a Solved Problem? And then within the post, he went on to say in fairly colorful language, the root of all evil, the Achilles heel of query optimization is the estimation of cardinalities. He then says the model can easily introduce orders of magnitude errors. And in the conclusion, he ends with this very cynical statement. The wonder isn't why you got a bad plan. The wonder is why would you ever get a good plan? So essentially what he's saying is that you need to pray very hard, cross your fingers and your toes, and then you may luckily get a good plan. Another way of thinking about this is that in most real world applications, the average case behavior is close to best case rather than worst case. So even if you take something like sorting, the behavior is usually very close to the ideal rather than the worst case behavior. But in database query optimization, it is the other way around. The average case is very close to worst case. So you might now be asking as to what on earth have database researchers been doing over the past five decades and how come they haven't solved the problem as yet? And in fact, there has been a large body of work given the both the academic as well as industrial importance of the issue. And all this prior literature falls into essentially three approaches. The first is to say, let me use better mathematical techniques for the estimation process. For, instead, for instance, instead of using these piecewise linear histograms, let me use wavelets instead. Or in the contemporary world, let me use deep learning based models. The second approach is to come up with more robust plan choices that can be expected to do reasonably, reasonably well despite the modeling errors. And finally, the last approach is to do runtime reoptimization. That is, you start executing with your initial plan, and then as you go through the execution, keep comparing the cardinalities that you are actually seeing with what you thought you might get. If there is a substantive discrepancy between what is happening and what you thought would happen, then go back to the drawing board and go through the query optimization process again. But this time, instead of using the model estimates, replace them with the actual values that you have seen thus far. So for instance, if the scan resulted in 10 rows of the student table, instead of the 1,000 that you are expecting, then you can override the model estimate with the true value 
and then go on from there with the rest of the optimization process. And you can do this repeatedly as you go up through the operator tree. So if you'll permit me some artistic license, we can draw analogies between these three approaches and some of our famous cricketers. So the first approach is like VVS Lakshman, extremely stylish and elegant. Whereas the second approach is like Rahul Dravid, always dependable, no matter what type of wicket you are playing on. And finally, the re-optimization approach is like Mahi, where you continually keep adapting to the playing conditions as the game goes through twists and turns. But just like these excellent cricketers could not always guarantee a victory, in the same way, none of these prior approaches to cardinality estimation can give you strong guarantees about plan quality. So in this desolate landscape, our lab at IISC has been able to provide some fresh hope by developing a completely new query processing technique, which we call as plan bouquets. And the key feature of plan bouquets is that rather than trying to fix the estimation process, it just throws it away, viewing it as an impossible problem that can only be solved by Rajnikanth. So for mere mortals, we should not even be trying to do this estimation. Instead, what plan bouquets does is that it leverages a discovery mechanism that figures out the cardinalities at runtime. And because of this new approach, for the very first time in the literature, we are now able to provide performance guarantees even in the worst case. And moreover, these guarantees are in comparison to an offline ideal that magically knows the correct values of all the cardinalities. That is essentially God's algorithm. So in the rest of this talk, I'll walk you through the core concepts of plan bouquet. And getting back to the title of this talk, I'll show you that plan bouquet is based on stupid ideas, but it works surprisingly well in practice. So to start with, we will take the notion of cardinality and convert it into an equivalent normalized value, which is typically known as selectivity. And this number goes from zero to 100% and takes the ratio of the estimated number of output rows to the maximum that could be possible. So for instance, let's say that an online university is offering 20,000 courses but you are only interested in the cheap courses that charge less than 1,000 rupees. Let us say that the estimated number of such cheap courses is 4,000. Then the selectivity is 4,000, which is the output, the estimated output, over 20,000, which would be the worst case situation or the maximum possible value. And this corresponds to 20%. So essentially think of selectivity as a water tap. If you open the tap to only a small extent, then only a little water would flow. Whereas if the tap is completely open, then you will have large amounts of data flowing into the execution pipeline. So now on the top right, you will see an SQL query that is similar to our earlier example, but adds this predicate that you are only interested in knowing which are the cheap courses that are being taken by the students. So given this particular query, we can now construct a three-dimensional space where each dimension refers to a particular operator's estimated selectivity. So here there are three operators. So on the x-axis, you have the selectivity of the cheap courses, that is, what is the estimated number of or uh, fraction of cheap courses, while the y and z axis refer to the selectivities of the two join operators, that is course join register and student join register. 
and all of them are in this zero to hundred percent normalized range. So given the space, we can now come up with performance metrics. So let Q sub E represent the estimated location of the query in the selectivity space. Then let, so that's the red dot in this picture that you see here. So that's the red dot here. And then let Q sub A represent the actual location of the query in the same space. So this is the green dot that you see here. And what this picture is telling you is that the query optimizer thought the location was 5,2,8 in this three-dimensional space. But at runtime, when you are actually executing the query, to your horror, it is discovered that the location is actually far away and it is at 75, 62, 85. Now let P sub OE and P sub OA, which is what you see here, represent the optimal plans at each of these locations. So what is going to happen is that you will use the red plan P sub OE at the green location Q sub A because of your incorrect estimate. And due to the incorrect estimate, you will have a suboptimality, which is the cost of using the red plan at the green location as compared to the ideal green plan at the green location. This number can obviously be only one or larger and is captured by the expression that you see here. Now, this suboptimality that I just described was defined for a specific pair of estimated and actual locations. That is for a specific Q sub B e and a specific Q sub A. But since we want to cater to the worst case, we need to consider all pairs of locations over the entire three-dimensional space. And this brings us to the notion of maximum suboptimality or MSO, which is the maximum suboptimality over all such pairs in the selectivity space. Essentially, it captures your nightmare situation. So now let's look at how do the contemporary database systems behave with regard to this MSO metric. And for simplicity, we'll only consider the case where there is a one-dimensional selectivity space. So for our instance, in our earlier example, we will only consider the cheap course dimension where the courses are all less than a thousand rupees. So to model this error prone selectivity, we will create a parametric version of the query, which is what you see at the top left here, where the selectivity of the course table is varied from zero to 100. And this is shown by the dollar one placeholder in the query. And you can do this by changing the threshold value of cheap courses from being close to zero to a very large number, say one lakh rupees that exceeds all the course fees. So essentially you have a knob that can be smoothly dialed from zero to hundred. And based on this, you can create the graph that you see on the right hand side where the selectivity knob setting is the x-axis shown on a log scale. On the y-axis is the cost of the optimal plan for each of these selectivity settings. And this optimal cost profile is shown by the green line. When you drill down into it, you will find that this green line is composed of different execution plans in different segments. So for instance, at the very beginning, at the low selectivity values, we have a plan P1 where the course and register are joined first, and then the result is joined with student. And both these joins, as you can see in the structure here, are implemented with NL, which is nested loops join. But then as you increase the selectivity, that is, as you go to the right here, you find that the optimal plan now changes to P2, 
where one of the nested loops joints that you had before is now replaced by a sort merge joint. Then as you go further, you find that you now come up with plan P3. And here, the hash join or HJ has now made an entrance. And then you have plan P4, where both the joints are implemented through hash joints. And finally, when you reach P5, you observe that even the join order has changed. It is now the register join student first and then followed by course. Whereas it was the other way around here, it was course joined with register first and then with student. Okay. So both the sequence and the physical implementation choices have changed over the spectrum from low selectivity to high selectivity. In this context, it's also important to note that the x-axis is also on a log scale. So the optimal costs do change substantially from around 6,000, which you see here, all the way to around 1 million at the large selectivity values. So these five plans that you see, P1, P2, P3, P4, and P5, are called the parametric optimal set of plans or POSP for short. So now if you take each of these optimal plans, which were optimal in a specific region of the space, and extend their behavior over the entire space, you get the picture that you see in this slide. You see that, for example, that the red plan, which is the P1 here, is initially very good. That's why it's optimal here. Then it progressively becomes worse, and it's replaced by plan P2 which is the best here. Then this is replaced by P3, then by P4, and then by P5. So now we earlier saw that the green line, which was composed of five different plans, is the best or optimal profile. But in practice, you may get the red line instead that you see here, which is the worst case behavior in this environment. To understand how we assess this worst case behavior, let's look at this right extreme here. Okay. So assume that you thought that the query had a very low selectivity of only 1%. So you thought that there are very few cheap courses. Again, to your horror, you find that the most of the courses are cheap. In this case, 99%. So what is happening? You're going to use the plan P1, which was recommended for the low percentage selectivities. You're going to use it here where the selectivity is actually very high, and therefore you will get a suboptimality, which is about 20 times worse than the ideal. In the same way, you can go and do this at the opposite end of the spectrum, where here you have estimated that most of the courses are cheap, but actually you find that only a very few of them turn out to be less than 1,000 rupees, for example. So in this case, the suboptimality is going to be as large as 100 because you used this plan, P5, in a region where ideally you should have used P1 instead. So if you look at MSO, which is the worst case suboptimality over the entire selectivity range, then that is the worst case ratio between red over green. And in this particular case, that happens to be at this left extreme where the maximum suboptimality is 100. So what it's telling you is that the plan that you choose to execute your query could be a hundred times worse than the ideal choice in hindsight. Okay, so we'll now see how our new technique, plan bouquet, functions in this same environment. So we start with this initial optimal profile composed of the five plans. And then what we do is that we draw Oops, sorry. We, we draw horizontal lines that form a geometric progression over the cost profile. In this case, the common ratio between these horizontal lines is two. And since the y-axis is on a log scale, we see that the lines appear equidistant from each other. So the Horizontal lines are called as IC or ISO cost lines. And in this case, you have seven such lines, IC1 through IC7. And they represent constant cost values. 
because they correspond to points on the y axis so the first li line here is at 12000 then it's 24000 then 48000 96000 and so on so each time you are doubling the cost here so then in the next step what we do is we consider all those plans that are located at the points where the horizontal lines intersect this optimal profile, which is indicated by the black squares that you see here. In this case, we have the plan P1 showing up at four different locations here, and then this plan P2 here, and then P3 here, and then P5. So notice that plan P4 is missing, and therefore, our plan bouquet will only consist of those plans that appear at the intersections. So the bouquet will be composed of P1, P2, P3, and P5, but P4 will not be present because it occurs, its optimality regions occurs in the space between two isocost lines. So although in this particular example, you find that the plan bouquet is a large number of plans compared to the original number, if you look at practical situations, the bouquet size is going to be much, much smaller than the overall number of plans in the profile. Okay, so now let's see how we'll actually execute this query using the plan bouquet idea. And I'll explain this through an example where the query happens to be actually located at 5%, which is what I've shown here, 5% selectivity. But we, of course, don't know this at the time of execution. And as I had highlighted, in plan bouquet, we will not do any estimation. Instead, what we will do is we'll start at the origin here, where you see a green star, and then we will execute plan P1, which is known to be optimal in this region, but with a limited time budget equivalent to the first ISO cost line, which in this case happens to be 12,000. If the query happens to complete within this budget, we would of course output the results. But in this particular case, it will not complete since the actual location is at 5%. So whatever investment you have made is insufficient to complete the query. So now when this budget gets exhausted, what we will do is we will terminate the execution of P1 and then we will throw away all the partial results and then move on to the next ISO cost line, which is what you see here. Here the plan again happens to be P1, and but now we will give it double the budget which happens to be 24,000, as you can see here. Now, this also won't complete, and we will again throw away the partial results. Then we will execute plan P1 with a budget of 48,000, then a budget of 96,000, and so on. None of these will complete. Then we'll come to this line, where we'll switch to plan P2, and now give it a budget of 192,000, this also won't complete. Then we will move on to P3, which is what you see here, with a doubled budget of 384,000. And now this will complete because you have given more time to this optimal plan than is required for the selectivity of 5%. In fact, so maybe let me show you this animation here. So this is the way that we went. We executed plan P1 four times with each time doubling the budget. Then we executed P2 with 192,000. That didn't work. Finally, we executed P3 with a budget of 384,000. And it actually completes with slightly lesser time of 340,000. So essentially, we have an execution plan pattern where we use multiple plans with progressively doubling time budgets until you successfully complete the query execution. Okay, so now the question is that, is this approach predicated on stupid ideas? And in fact, yes, very much so. The reason is that we are incurring an enormous amount of computational effort at both compile time, where we have to produce the green line optimal profile, and then at runtime, our trial and error approach requires you to repeatedly throw away partial work completions. So this actually appears a recipe for disaster. And in fact, whenever I present this approach to industry experts for the first time, 
the immediate reaction is that you guys must be nuts. However, in the remainder of this talk, I'll show you that in tandem, these ideas actually work surprisingly well. So let us start by computing the amount of effort that was involved or invested in our plan bouquet approach for this specific 5% example. The total cost that we had to pay was the initial 12,000, then 24,000, then 48,000, 96,000, 192,000, and then the final successful execution with 340,000. If you add all of this up, this is 710,000. Now notice that the ideal plan or God's plan would have magically known that the query was located at 5% and therefore would have incurred exactly this cost, which is 340,000. So the suboptimality that is being uh, 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 incurred by the plan bouquet approach is 7.1 divided by 3.4, which is roughly 2.1. And in fact, you can do some fairly obvious optimizations and bring this 2.1 down even further to 1.8. So notice that these numbers are very much smaller as compared to the MSO of 100 that you saw with the contemporary database optimizers. But you might be skeptical and say that, okay, that worked out well in this specific case because you carefully cherry-picked the 5% location Maybe it is possible that at some other location in the x-axis, that is in the selectivity space, plan bouquet may have been much worse than the 100 that we saw with the contemporary optimizers. Okay, So to address this concern, in this graph, I've drawn the green and red lines as before. So this is the optimal profile. This is the contemporary da database systems. And in addition, I've also added the performance of the blue line which shows you over the entire spectrum of selectivities, the worst case suboptimality of the plan bouquet approach. And the worst case would be the case where there's a maximum gap between the blue line and the green line. Now you see that's no longer at the extreme, but actually closer to the 1% mark here. And even here, the worst case ratio is just 3.1, which is what you see here. So therefore, no matter where the query actually lies in this entire space from zero to 100%, our approach will be far robust as compared to the state of the art. But then the next question you may ask is, are these good results only true for the particular example query that I might have selectively chosen in order to show us in a good light? Or would it be true in general? So to address this concern, Let's abstract away the query and just consider any one-dimensional selectivity space. And let us say the actual query location happens to be between these two uh, points on the x-axis, which is Q sub k minus 1 and Q sub k, which correspond to the selectivity locations where the ISO cost lines intersect with the ideal profile. So given this in plan bouquet, what we are essentially doing is to follow a staircase approach to reach the actual selectivity, which is here. That is, we initially invest A. So this is a uh, notation I'm using from the geometric progression. So the starting value is A. And then we the next one is AR, and then AR squared. This is the subsequent investments that you're making. So as you go up through the staircase, the collective cost that you're incurring is A plus AR plus AR squared and so on, all the way up to AR to the power of K minus 1. In comparison, the ideal offline algorithm would have only incurred this cost because it magically knew that the query was located at Q sub A. So now if we compute this relative cost, we find that the total investment by plan bouquet is the sum of this geometric series, which is the cost of the first ISO cost step, then second step, third step, and so on, which can be expressed as you see here so in the general notation, it will be A plus AR and so on. And this we trivially know is expressible in this closed form format. Now, the optimal or the ideal algorithm would have incurred a cost that is somewhere between these two values. But since we are looking for the worst case of optimality, 
we will be most conservative and assume that it's actually only this much. Okay? So this is essentially the best case for the optimal, which would be this value. So now if we, the suboptimality would be computed as the ratio of this expression to this expression. And what you can very trivially show is that it's upper bounded by R squared over R minus one. The critical point to note here is there is no dependency on K that is on the actual location. Further, we can minimize this expression at R equal to two, which results in an MSO of four. So what we are saying here is that irrespective of the query, irrespective of the location of the query, the plan bouquet will always finish within four times of the ideal algorithm. Now you may say even four looks a bad number, but recall that in contemporary systems, the suboptimality could be in hundreds or thousands or even more. So what we have done in essence is to convert something that was absolutely terrible into something that is mildly horrible. At this stage, you may also ask, how do you know that the four is the best that you can get? Isn't it possible to improve the MSO even below four? But unfortunately, that is not the case because we have theoretically proved that four is the best achievable with any deterministic algorithm. However, with the randomized algorithms, one could do better to some extent. So, so far I had only talked about one dimensional selectivity spaces. We have also extended our analysis to show that in general for D dimensional spaces, the MSO of plan bouquet can be bounded with the expression that you see here, which is D squared plus 3D. And notice that this is independent of both the query and the platform. So the last question we need to answer after the theoretical analysis is that, does this work well at all in practice? And to address this question, here is a sample performance on the Postgres database engine. And in this graph, on the x-axis, we have various industrial benchmark queries along with the dimensionality of their selectivity space. So for instance, this 3D underscore H underscore Q5 means that it is a three-dimensional selectivity space corresponding to the TPCH benchmarks query number five. On the y-axis is the worst case performance, MSO performance on a log scale. So it goes from one, which is the best that you could of course have, all the way to a hundred million. And what you see in this particular graph is that the Postgres native query optimizer, which corresponds to the red columns that you see here, has several skyscrapers with some even exceeding a million, as you can see here. So, not, so this is the million line and the plan that Postgres is giving you, which you thought is the optimal plan and which the system also thought is the optimal plan, in hindsight is actually a million times slower than the ideal plan. So in comparison, if you look at plan bouquet, which is all these green columns that you see here, it's always within a factor of two, of a factor of 10 to 20 of the ideal. Okay, so in summary, the plan bouquet approach achieves quantifiable performance guarantees for the first time. And it also has several other practical benefits that I did not have time to talk about. For instance, it is robust to changes in the database distribution. It is easy to deploy and it also provides stability in execution behavior. So if you are interested in this line of work, then you can refer the documents that you see listed here, which are all available off our lab, lab website at IISC. The initial concepts paper came out in Sigmod 2014. Then there was a software demo in VLDB 2014, which also won the best demo award. Then a significantly expanded version appeared in the ACM Transactions on Database Systems or TODS in 2016. 
We later had follow-up work, which came out in well-known IEEE forums. And over the past years, I have given three-hour tutorials on this subject at various leading international conferences. So to wind up, the overall takeaway of this presentation is that given the declarative nature of SQL queries, we would like to have optimal execution strategies. However, there is a terrible demon which comes in between asking, do you know the correct selectivities? And in this situation, the Gandhigiri approach of plan bouquet can placate the de demon and provide near optimal performance. So the meta message is that even stupid ideas can turn out to be surprisingly useful if you are able to use them in a creative manner. So with that, I'll end my presentation and thank you for the patient listening. I'll be happy to address any questions that you might have. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much for a very wonderful talk. Uh, there are some questions in the Q&A box. I will take one by one. Sure. Uh, so the first one is, uh, what are the challenges envisaged when you are handling with the real-time uh, sensitive data like the biomedical data? Okay, so the, what I uh, discussed today has nothing to do with the privacy and security issues. That's a completely orthogonal topic as to how you protect data. There's lots of very nice techniques that have been done. So for example, what you could do is that, especially this happens in the data mining world, is that you are not interested in the raw data, but you're interested in the models that you could produce from the data. But the people who are giving you the data are worried that you may use it to blackmail them at some future time. So we have come up with techniques by which you can apply perturbations on the original data such that you cannot trace back the data to the person who actually had submitted this information, but the statistical models still remain correct. So these are called matrix-based pertur perturbations, and we have shown that a certain kind of Toeplitz matrix, so you can read this up on our website, it's in uh, the ICD conference of 2005, can give you the uh, perturbation with the least condition number. And the condition number is the ratio of the highest eigenvalue to the lowest eigenvalue of the matrix, and gives you some sense of stability. Apart from that, there are lots of other works that have been done, including this notion of differential privacy that has become very popular over the last decade or so. And there, the idea is that the results that you're getting should not be able to distinguish between whether the specific row that you're interested in was whether it was present in the original data or not. Okay? So the privacy part is completely separate. We are looking at saying that given an SQL query that has survived through all these privacy and security mechanisms, how do you execute it to get you the best response time? So how do, what is the fastest execution of this query? And as I said, typically database systems assume that whatever strategy they're suggesting is the best. But actually we have found out that's not really the case. It's often terrible. So we want to come up with alternative mechanisms by which you can hope to get something which if not the best is fairly close to the best and is not orders of magnitude worse. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question. Uh, I have a question regarding the database file. If the data is enormous, file size, instead of yeah. one single file, is it possible to save the database file in various chunks and query the entire database using one query? Oh, let's see. Uh, already databases are doing that for a long time. So firstly, each table is usually stored in a separate operating systems file. Then in addition to that, you might say that there may be a single table, which is a very large file. You can always break it up into various chunks. This is called as sharding also. And you can break it up in two ways. You can break it up horizontally, where you say that here is the first thousand rows, then the next thousand rows, the next thousand rows in separate files. Or you can also break it up vertically, which is called as columnar databases, where you take the roll number column and store it separately. You take the name column and store it separately and so on. So the traditional databases were all row-based databases where if you are partitioning the table, you are partitioning it horizontally. So you had a cake and you cut it sideways. But today, most uh, of the database systems have become what are called as vertical or columnar databases where you cut them vertically and different columns are stored in uh, uh, different files. And even in those columns, you can break them up horizontally. So partitioning has been a standard practice in databases for a long time. It could be either within the same machine or distributed across multiple machines over a wide area network. 
So hosting data is not a problem at all. If you look at the income tax, so which some of you may be filing because July 31st is the last day, the entire income tax uh, records of India are stored on a distributed database system. Okay? And this is uh, maybe about 200 crore people are paying taxes. So the information is stored not only in a distributed fashion for uh, availability and locality, it's also stored for security purposes because you want replicas of the information. So in case one site goes down, some other site should be able to pick it up. The same thing happens with the National Stock Exchange in uh, Mumbai. You have a hot recovery center, which is in Chennai. So the moment the stock exchange goes down in Mumbai, the traders will obviously be very upset if you have to shut down the system. There's an immediate recovery that's done to, uh, to, to a near recovery site, which is uh, a few kilometers away in Mumbai. And even if that fails, then they shift to Chennai. And if that fails, they, sh they shift to a separate clearing agency. So there are multiple layers of firewalls that have been built into all these mission critical systems. Sure, sir. sure. Thank you, sir. Next question. Uh, Google's algorithm response time is amazingly effective. How is their page ranking algorithm able to achieve yeah. this always? Yeah, see, but the page ranking is not an SQL query, right? There you are asking for a very specific operation to be done and you have already created uh, in some sense, the optimized code for that purpose. But in database systems, we are allowing you to come and ask arbitrary queries. So the big difference between your normal programming and database systems is that in database systems, we don't know in advance what are the queries you're going to ask, and we cannot recompile the system each time. So actually, the query language gives you the ability to ask new questions on the fly that had not been anticipated at design time. So you can come and write this select from where kind of clauses that I showed you dynamically and ask an extremely complex query. Nobody is even expecting it. Nobody is prepared for it. But immediately the system has to answer it. So in comparison to that, page rank is a simple computation. I mean, not simple in terms of computation, but in terms of the concept, which is a very specific operation that's being done. And that is obviously going to be written in procedural code. But in the database world, we are saying that here is the manager of the company now wanting to do some complicated analysis trying to find out why sales are not very good in the western part of the country or why is dharwad peda selling better in bangalore than in dharwad itself okay if i can give you a local <laughs> example yes. you may want to find this out in case it's happening that way so you are doing a lot of exploratory analysis saying why is this happening why is that happening show me interesting stuff and that cannot be predicted in advance and therefore, all these questions, which are extremely complex questions, some of them take hours to answer, are being given to you with absolutely no warning. And now you have to supposed to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the computational complexity is much harder and it's also dynamic. It's not that you're repeatedly doing the same things. The questions are also new. It's not just that the data is new. The question itself is new. Sure, sure. So it's like your JE exam. If suddenly they change the model and ask you new questions, would you be able to handle it dynamically? Whereas right now we know the question set pattern and the, maybe the values are being changed in the parameters to the questions. But if the question pattern itself changed, yes. then things will be very different. And in fact, that is true in the sense that when we took the JE exam, it was all long answers. Today, everything is uh, uh, multiple choice, yeah. right? The sure. world has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sir. Uh, probably a follow-up question. Is there a way to pose it as a formal optimization problem to say minimize yeah. total cost? Yes, actually it is a formal process because it does use the dynamic programming exercise, but it cannot use the machine learning kind style of optimizations because here you have to build up the cost for each of the operators. Mm -hmm. So people have tried to do this, but the danger is that if you look at the inputs, they are extremely volatile in the sense that suppose you're trying to join two columns and I'll just give a specific example. One column has all the values being A and the other column has all the values being B. And if you say, tell me those rows in which the value of is the same in this column and the other column. And obviously none of the rows will match because these are all A's and these are all B's. But if one of the B's changes to an A, then it matches with everything here. So with an atomic change, you may go from having no output to a billion rows in the output. So it is extremely sensitive and volatile. That is why machine learning cannot work well in these environments because machine learning assumes there's a certain stability in the whole thing or that is a slowly changing system. But if you have a chaotic system where minor changes in the input can cause macro changes in the output, 
then learning is not a very good approach because it's hard for it to predict the sudden transitions. And therefore, we need to use the dynamic programming kind of systematic computational techniques where you build up the global optimal with an aggregation of local optimals. So it is a formal optimization process, but using not the modern day techniques, but using classical Bellman's optimality uh, 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 theorems. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. So the next one is more like a query. Uh, are the big data files stored in ASCI uh, or binary format nowadays? Uh, okay, so if you look in most of the uh, database tables, you will find that all the numeric attributes like the integers, the floats and so on would be stored in binary format. But you may find that strings would be for, uh, stored in character format. So in order to reduce the space that is being required, typically numbers would be stored in binary, but strings would be used stored in character format. But having said that, many databases do lots of interesting kinds of compression techniques. So for example, if you said that uh, the, uh, the date of birth is one of the columns in your database, then we can say that the base value is, let's say, 19, 000, uh, 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 1980, and then all the students are differential amounts from 1980. So the first student is 20 years old, somebody is 21 years old, somebody is 23 and so on. But if you keep the baseline as 1980, then you can store only the difference. And the difference could be stored in one byte. Sure. So this is a very standard technique that is used in many cases. You can also use other kinds of compression techniques like run length encoding and so on. And especially when you have columnar databases, you can do various kinds of patterns that you find in the uh, uh, in, in the column could be related together and you could use uh, things like arithmetic uh, compression or you could use LZW compression and so on. There's a big uh, literature on how to do database compression. The danger with compression is that it's easy to compress. Anybody can do it. But if I then ask you a question about your particular record, do you have to decompress the whole file in order to access it? So in your current zip and uh, 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 other kinds of uh, uh, com uh, compression techniques, you can compress it and store it in a small uh, 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 footprint. But if you want to ask something of it, you have to open the whole file. In databases, you don't want to do that. So we have what is called as context-aware compression, where you're allowed to do the query processing in the compressed domain directly. So it's like the Fourier transform. You move from the time domain to the frequency domain, do all the operations there, and then come back to the time domain. You can do the same in databases also if you design the compression algorithm well, that you can take the query and convert the query into the compressed domain, do the processing, get the compressed results, and then decompress only the results. But this is a huge body of work uh, that uh, has already existed on how to do compression well in database systems. Sure. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question, maybe slightly on a lighter note. As an evangelist, how difficult were or it was easy to convince people of the latent power of the absurd idea? Yeah. So as I said, initially there will be resistance even to the ideas that we presented uh, here. Uh, many of the industry experts whom we happen to know well, the initial reactions were always very skeptical, saying something is wrong here. But actually, I viewed that as a positive because it then means that we have found out something that is surprising and goes against the conventional wisdom. To me, good research is when people get surprised by it. If you're just polishing the ball and doing the obvious, yeah, maybe it's useful, but it's not particularly interesting. So if you do something where the initial reaction of people is saying, this cannot be true, but then you can actually show them subsequently that it's in fact the case, then it means that you alone saw something that even the experts, let alone the lay people, could not see. So you had that insight, which was special. And you know, at least to me, that's uh, kind of the epitome of good research, is to come up with results that go against the conventional wisdom. Sure, sir, sure. Thank you, sir. And one last question. Uh, this is more on the pedagogy. Uh, how do you think the curriculum should be modified or, uh, or it can accommodate this latent power of this absurd idea? Uh, well, at least what I would say is that one of the problems that I see currently, especially in the computer science curriculum, is that they tend to trust the machine rather than trusting their own stomach because the stomach is the source of all ideas. So let me just give a very simple example to motivate this is that we often find that when students portray a certain number that is being measured, 
on their slides or in the reports, they'll typically give it to maybe 10, 20 uh, 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 digits of precision. But if you had done your physics 101, you would have realized that unless the measuring instrument has that precision, you cannot code such numbers. So if you are having a frequency meter, which can only measure at one hertz, you cannot write 6.7534237 and so on. It's physically incorrect to be doing that. And you're violating all of Newton's laws in that process. But that doesn't seem to deter computer science students. They're happily willing to do that saying, sir, I did cut and paste from the meter here. But that means you have lost the knowledge of physics in the process. So the last thing any computer scientist should do is to do programming. <laughs> You should only do it if your gun is held to your head. The first thing you should do is to spend time thinking about the problem. The domain knowledge is very important. The concepts are very important. Certainly, yes, programming is useful, but as a proof of concept, not as a starting point saying, I'll type main.c and then let me cobble together something because then you lose sight of the physics of the problem. And any day, physics comes first, computer science comes second. Okay, Although, although I'm part of computer science, I'm saying that is we should not... Uh, 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 in a sense, diminish the role of the domain in doing these activities. And this is especially for true for data science. I have another talk which I give, which is the title is Data Science and Astrology. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? And the conclusion is that astrology is more accurate than data science. Why? Because most of the data science that's being done today, especially in India, is by people who don't understand the domain. They're just saying, look, I have a huge amount of data. I have TensorFlow. I have Google Cloud, I run the algorithm, something will come out. And there's a famous statement by the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist called Ronald Coase. He said that if you torture the data enough, it will confess to anything. So most of the results that you get today are wrong. You saw, all of you saw that yourself with the COVID models. Second wave, not one out of the more than dozen models that were there in the country predicted that there would be a very sharp spike and an extremely dangerous spike. Not one of them. Okay. So this clearly tells you that data is fine, but data should come last, not first. First is mind, first is stomach. Okay. Mind is the, 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 the proof of the concept should come last. So we should not turn things the other way around and not put the horse before the cart. Okay. So if you want to look at the talk, I have that video on our website, maybe that will to show you why even well-meaning people, even very good scientists have made basic blunders in using data science because you think of it as a magic wand. Here is the data, here are the computational tools, here is the cloud infrastructure, run it. And something will come out, but typically it will be wrong. So data science encourages you to ask the wrong questions. That's the danger. You should be asking the questions independently of data science and then coming and saying, okay, here is a tool which helps me answer this question. But it shouldn't create the question in the first place. Okay. Sure. Sorry for going off on my pet peeve over data science, yeah. but this but, is something that I see very much in practice nowadays, that people don't understand what they're doing. Okay. Sure, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, now we will take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Jayant Harsita for a very wonderful uh, and uh, invigorating talk. Uh, I, the team somewhat would also like to thank the audience for participation and their queries and taking time from the busy schedule and attending. Uh, Samvad is a monthly event which is jointly hosted by IIT Dharwad and INABC, which is the uh, Indian National Academy of Engineering Bangalore chapter. The details will be posted on our website, IIT Dharwad. We request you to take a uh, look at it. Thank you very much and a good day, sir. Thank you once again, sir, for accepting our, uh, our invitation and delivering a wonderful talk, sir. Thank you very My much. My pleasure. Uh, thanks to the patient audience. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you.